Good evening, everybody. My name is Ibrahim Shreyh. I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live from uh, Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan. Uh, this is, if you want to visit Madiram, you will have a camera ride in your way to Petra, in which you pass through this slit between the rocks, the Ross city, and then you'll find the magic of Petra, one of the world seven wonders. And this is Petra at night. Our topic for tonight is cerebellum and time angle meningioma, the clinical radiological operative and pathological correlation. Uh, Harvey Cushing was the one who coined the term meningioma from meninges. And everybody thinks that the meningiomas arise from the dura. Actually, they arise from the arachnoid. Supratentorial, much more than the infratentorial, 90% versus 10%. So most of the neurons are above the tent. The 10% below the tent are the most difficult. So we'll talk about infratentorial meningiomas, and among these are the cerebellopentine angle meningiomas. So what is the origin of these meningiomas? <clears throat> we have to know some anatomy. And the anatomy of neurosurgery was not done by anybody better than Albert Rotten, late Albert Rotten. He's a great mentor, a great anatomist, a great surgeon who was raised in Gainesville, Florida, in a poor family. He admits that. And one of the things that he always speak about in his lectures that if God created him at the time of his birth and he put a condition on him, telling him, Albert Roton, I want you to go to school, medical school, and then become a neurosurgeon, and then do the best to be the best of the neurosurgeons. I want to get you one child with a brain tumor I want you to remove his brain tumor, and then I will take your life. So God is offering Albert Rotten that his study, his whole study, is just to save one patient's life. And Albert Rotten would say, I would have accepted. So we learned lots of anatomy from him. This is the inside of the skull. This is artificial skull. This is real skull. And the skull is made of many bones. Uh, the central bone is the sphenoid bone, but the most difficult bone is the temporal bone. It is the most difficult. And if you look at the temporal bone from the outside, if you take it out from the skull, it's a magic thing. It's made of six bones. And if you add the three ossicles, then it's made of nine bones, nine segments, nine areas. <clears throat> so this is the inside of the, of the the temporal bone, squamous bone, petrous bone, and this is the image of it. This is the inside. Here is the temporal bone. So temporal is making a joint with the occipital bone, and the jugular foramen is a foramen between the occipital bone and the temporal bone. Again, central part is the clivus, the upper, middle, and lower clivus, three zones. And there is an angle between the petrous and the clivus called petroclival angle. <clears throat> no one would appreciate this angle except the skull based surgeons because they know that every millimeter counts. Uh, this is a view I took with my camera when I was uh, attending one of the Rotten courses in Gainesville, Florida. So if you just attend there, you will gain a lot. He's, he's gone now, but his center is still the most important cadaveric lab in the world. Uh, so this is the trigeminal nerve. This is the vestibular facial nerve on both sides. And these are the lower clinical nerves. This is the medulla, vertebral, vertebral muscle. It's a very complex anatomy. If you don't know that anatomy by heart, you should not be there at all. So this is the view. <coughs> And this is uh, just a close-up view on the uh, that side, on the on the left side, trigeminal nerve, uh, the vestibular and cochlear nerve going into the internal duodenum. To do the surgery for the cerebellum in time, we'll be working here. So the knowledge of anatomy is of utmost importance. Brain surgery is not bare holes or subdural. It's not a disc prolapse. It's none of these. 
in this small segment of the skull base, every little important thing and essence of your life is there. All the cranial nerves are grouped there. This is internal jugular foramen with the glossopharyngeal vacuous and accessory. This is the seventh and eighth, and here is the trigeminal nerve, and this is the sixth nerve, all within a few centimeters. Again, the vertebrals, the basilar, the ica, the pica, the superior cerebellar, the superior cerebral, the relationship with these the neurovascular bundles. You don't, re you don't remember them, you just memorize them and just encrypt them in your, in your memory. Again, the trigeminal nerve in Nichols Cave, the internal auditory meatus with the seventh and eighth, and the three nerves in the internal jugular foramen. And this set, jugular foramen, above it, internal auditory meatus. This way is the uh, trigeminal cave, or Nichols Cave. This is the middle fossa, as you see it from there. And this is when you remove the dura, this is the trigeminal nerve. And this is the back of the clivus. This is the sixth nerve going into the Rollos Canal. The Rollos Canal is a story on its own to know exactly what's going on there. So you have here the internal detrimators with seventh and eighth. Trigeminal going to Michels, fifth nerve, and this is the sixth. Each part of millimeter here is very important. So the tumors are rising here and you should know it. Again, when you go in, this is the trigeminal nerve, this is seventh and eighth nerve, this is the space between them, this is called the pre area, and this is one of the veins called vein of dandy or superior betrothal vein. So, still, where is the, the cerebral of antenna angle meningioma arise from? What is the origin? People say it's coming from the cortex. Lateral group, supramatal, inframatal, prematal, and petroclimal. Uh, this is a very important paper by Sigru about these so called cortical cerebellar meningiomas, like this. So, this is medial cortical, this is lateral cortical, this is outside petrous meningioma. In my series, I collected this for you. This is lateral or uh, cortical cerebellar meningioma. This is outer petrous meningioma. This is meningioma that is arising lateral to the internal detrimators. Here it is reaching to the internal detrimators. Here it is centered over the internal detrimators. Here it has across the area into the climax. Here it's taking all of the petrous area. These are my cases. Now, Again, these are my cases. When they go berserk, they go berserk. So this is a meningioma centered on the anterior detrimators. <coughs> it across to the clivus and then across to the nickel scape. Here it across to the other side. Here it across completely to the other side. Here is something that you cannot describe or give it a name. So where is the petroclival meningioma arising from? People say if it is arising here, it's called Pre-meatal, before the meatus, which is the internal tissue canal. Here it is called post-meatal, after the meatus. Here is the trigeminal nerve. So people are different. Do we consider this as petroclimal meningioma or do we consider it as cerebral and angle meningioma? So, Majid Sami has to be Mr. Sami has set the standard for the posterior fossa denantiums. He is the most experienced researcher in the world with posterior fossa. He's a friend of mine, he's a friend of my family, and I'm proud of this friendship and I learned a lot from him. Just to give you a hint about this man, he has done something like 5,000 acoustic neurons. So here he is visited Jordan so many times, visited my house, uh, I visited his house and so on. He's a great man, a great teacher. Here is one of his hot debates, He's, he fights for his opinions. Here I'm visiting his center in Hanover. And the other man that should be mentioned with the Basilophosa is Takeshi Kawase from Japan. Again, 
He's a great friend of mine, and we are members of the same groups of Skardes neurosurgeons. Uh, this is uh, our meeting in China. This is in Geneva. This is in Thailand. Again, we are members of the World Federation of the Neurosurgical Society, and we are members of the World Academy of Neurosurgery in Vienna. Uh, he's a great man and he's a great adventurer. He came to Jordan, what did he do? He just took a car with his wife, uh, Miki, and he just went alone without any guide to Petra, to Wadi Ram, and he went hitchhiking everywhere in Jordan. So this is his habit. Here he invited us to his conference in Mount Fuji, and he insisted in doing the Japanese food. The other man that should be mentioned is Osama al Mufti, a Syrian uh, origin. Uh, he's American, he's one of the uh, great uh, members of the Skaldate societies. Uh, he's a very honest man, a good man. So these people, they made our mind about these origins of the cerebellum and time angle in Java. To start with this, this paper from, again, uh, from Bassioni and, and his colleagues in East in Germany, they said, let's look at the posterior petrus or cerebellum and time angle in Joma. They had 47 patients and they looked at how many were before the auditory meters or behind the auditory meters or above the auditory meters or below. So in this series, the commonest number 19 is behind the auditory meters. But then came Majid Sami, 347 cases, the largest number of cerebellum and time angle in Joma. And he classified them that most of them are pre meated before the meters, which are the most difficult cases. So he wrote this many papers and the book about it, and this is a kind of pre meter before the meters. So most of the mini joma is in front of the internal meters. So when you come from behind, from posterior uh, fossa, you will find that the nerves will be on the back of the tumor, different types of these tumors. This type, again, is centered over the meters. Half of it in front, half of it in the back. And these are, again, one of the most difficult because the nerves are inside the tumor, like in this one. So when you look at the, at the pictures, you have to know where is the tumor in relation to these structures. So you have to be a radiologist on top of being a neurosurgeon. And this tab is supramatal, above the meters. So this is the meters above it. The nerves will be below. Or infra, it is below the meters. So each nerve will be in different position. Post meter behind the meters. And from there, they can extend to the jugular foramen here. They can extend to the internal detrimators inside the detrimators. And they can go everywhere. In part of the nickel scale. Lilliam Shaker of uh, Seattle, of, uh, of uh, United States, again, a great skeletal surgeon. Uh, again, a close friend and a member of these societies. He said, well, let's wait. If the meningioma arise from the vitreous stretch medial to the internal duty canal, this is not, you know, uh, this is not a cerebellum one time, this is vitrocline. So there is difference there, but it is a minor difference. What about the images? What do we see on those images? When I do images, I'm interested in few points. I and all the skeletal surgeons. This, ill-defined edges, multinodular. This is a very bad prognostic sign. I know that this case is gonna be very difficult and I wish I disappear or the patient disappear. But I don't like to operate on these patients. They are very tough. There's no plane of cleavage. Also, we look at T2. The darker, like this, the more fibrous, the tough. It is, it is firm, so you cannot manipulate it well. It is just like a rock. I also look for edema. If there is edema of the cerebellum and the brainstem, this is a very bad prognostic sign. It means that the pia has been well graded, so there is no pia. 
the, the, the tumor is inside the brain stem, inside the cerebral lobe. Another thing that I look at is the hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a bad sign. I also look for bony invasion. In this case, it is post meter, behind the meters, but it has invaded the bone completely. Look at this one, it has invaded the bone. What is the differential diagnosis of this? Any medical student, any uh, resident first year of neurosurgery should know that the commonest the three pathologies in the cerebral lobe and time angle are in this frequency. Vestibular schwannoma comes first, about 70, 80. 10, 15 is the meningioma, and then the epidermoid. But people don't think of the others. There are so many others, not only these three. Ask any radiologist, he will tell you these three. It's wrong. It's much more than this. Look at this. Facial schwannoma. Jugular foramen schwannoma. Lymphoma. Arachnoid cysts. Denet. And epidermoid, as we mentioned. Chondroma, chondrosarcoma, and the lymphatic sac. And neurosarcoidosis, metastasis, and choroid plexus papilloma. Medulloblastoma going into the cerebral lobentana angle. Uh, teratoid rhabdoid tumors, especially in children. Ependymoma. Cholesterol granuloma. Aneurysm. Aneurysm of the basilar or of the eye cap. Clivus cordoma. Trigeminal schwannoma. Glioma. Look at this. It's a glioma. It's not acoustic neuroma, nor meningioma, nor epidermoid. Cavernoma. Last time we presented cavernomas. This cavernoma is done in the internal detrimentus. The meningocytoma and lipoma and the glomus jugular. So we have to stop just thinking in two or three pathologies. The pathologies are there, but we do not think about them. The commonest thing, as I said, is acoustic neuroma. So you have to differentiate between acoustic neuroma. These are all acoustic neuromas, and these are all my cases. This is the largest acoustic neuroma I came across. Uh, very giant. So you have to differentiate between meningioma or schwannoma. Somebody may ask, why should I? Why should I bother? We have to do surgery for them, so why should I bother? You should bother because you have to discuss with the patient and the family what are the prospects of healing, the, the facial, prospects of life, prospects of recurrence, and you have to be prepared of what you are going to face inside. What tools would you do? So it is not just a mental exercise, it is actual exercise. <coughs> so there are points that differentiate between meningiomas and schwannomas, the broad contact with the vitreous bone, with the tentorium, the center is away from the internal canal, many, many items that can differentiate. You may need to do angiography, and I do in cases of giant tumors with vascular, so you get to know what is the pathology, what is the vascular, blood supply, and you may go and do embolization. You should do venography. This is very important. I just don't understand anybody asking for just a brain MRI. Brain MRI should include brain MRA, should include brain MRV. If you don't include that, you are not a good surgeon. In fact, you should stop practicing. Here in this view, superior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, transfer sinus, sigmoid sinus. This is uh, for any medical student, but here you have to see where is the cavernous sinus, where is the superior temporal, superior petrosal sinus, where is the inferior petrosal sinus here, and where is the vein of la bay. If you want to operate on those structures, you have to know. And this is the most serious of all, so-called occipital sinus. If you are not aware that there is occipital sinus, you may kill the patient without knowing. And most of the time, venography and, and uh, angiography are reported as a new aneurysms and no AVMs, which is a silly statement, to say the least. So you have to know all these veins, and one of the veins that you come across always is the severe betrothal vein, the vein of Dandy. Sacrifice it or not depends on so many factors. Again, the beauty of the venography, look at this. 
the cavernous sinus, the inferior petrosal, the severe petrosal, the vein, all this is essential anatomy knowledge. It is not a luxury, it is basic neurosurgery. And again, Albert Rotten, God bless his soul, uh, he died a couple of years ago. Uh, and I remember we were together in Sharm el Sheikh on a boat trip after lecturing. And he actually challenged everybody on the, on the trip, how many, how many press-ups can you do? He was 90 years of age and he won. He has done 140 press-ups. So he wrote a lot about the relationship of the betrothal vein with the severe betrothal sinus. Again, another man who done a lot of these is Osama Mifti, again about vein of Labay and its importance. So you may need to do embolization, we discuss that. I don't do it unless I have to, and most of the time I don't. But this is one case we did, and we embolized this in the German. This white stuff is the embolic material inside the tumor. The neogenomas of the internal detrimators. So don't say that because this lesion is inside the internal detrimators that it is acoustic in neuroma. This is a case report that has been published and this is this was a meningioma. And in another case, there were two, acoustic in neuroma and meningioma, acoustic in neuroma and meningioma, both in the same place. I had the pleasure of having two twins, the trigeminal schwannoma and acoustic neuroma. How do they present? Hearing loss, vertigo, headaches, trigeminal neuralgia, cerebellar signs, but rarely facial weakness, like the acoustics. But here is cerebellum internal angle meningioma presenting with hearing loss, because it's centered over the internal detrimators. <clears throat> How do we manage these cases? Observation, surgery, or radiation. Let's discuss. I only observe these cases. This is one case we had about last week. A young lady of about 39 or 40, who was accidentally was found to have this in a journal. Examining her, she had nothing, and this was discovered accidentally. So this is a place where you wait and observe. If it is a small, asymptomatic, if you find it incidentally, and if the patient is medically unstable and asymptomatic. So surgery is the mainstay. Complete surgical removal is the optimal treatment, but this should not be achieved at the expense of the patient's life and the quality of life. You should not be brave on the expense of the patient. You have to be honest. You know or you don't know. And most of the time, most of the neurosurgeons don't know yet they operate and kill patients. Let's go back to Kawase. He started this business in 1991. He discovered something called Kawase Triangle. And he would tell you that he discovered it accidentally. He said, I was lost during surgery. 1991, he was still young. He was lost during surgery. And he discovered this area of bone, which is devoid of any important structures. And he called it Kawase Triangle which is this one, Kawasi Triangle. If you drill that, you can go to the posterior fossa. So he wrote so many papers on this uh, approach, many, many papers, which I enjoyed reading. I read uh, three journals every month because there is a paper published in neurosurgery every minute. Do we ask residents during the residency program to write papers? No, it is not a condition in Jordanian, um, Jordanian board or the Arab board. There is no need for the neurosurgeon to be to write papers. So you are producing very non-elegant neurosurgeon. Sievert from Germany also used the sitting position or semi-sitting position. Al Mifti, again. He described what's called the Bermuda Triangle. This is the Bermuda Triangle. The, where the angle where the vein of Labay joins the transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus. This is Bermuda Triangle. You don't or you do know. 
most of the time, most of the neurosurgeons don't know. William Caldwell from Lake Salt Lake City in, in USA, he's the president, past president of the uh, uh, American Association of Neurosurgery, a close friend of mine, he wrote this paper about his experience in 109 cases together with uh, Taka Fukushima from Japan. So he said, anything, this is the tangible nerve, this is the meters, this is the jugular frame. He said, if you draw a line like this, anything medial is petroglider. So surgical approaches varies according to the size, the location of the tumor. Just to go through them quickly, this is called anterior transpetrosal or Kawase trend, Kawase approach, which we mentioned, or posterior petrosal, which was uh, championed by uh, Simon Lifty uh, after Hakuba. Uh, pre sigmoid, also, it is one of his achievements. You go before or pre sigmoid. And the workhorse is the retro sigmoid. I've tried the other uh, approaches. I love the retro sigmoid. And I learned from Majid Sami that you can reach any tumor at the posterior fossa with this approach. So here you are, retro sigmoid approach in, in our cases, semi sitting position. Uh, this is another approach of. Uh, Hassan al Mufti, <coughs> and uh, this is Anil, Anil Nanda from, uh, from uh, Louisiana. She reports, is a very uh, seasoned uh, skull based surgeon, and he would drill the bone behind and anterior to the interdestrimators. <coughs> Radio surgery. Many, many times I just said that <coughs> I have brought the gamma knife back in 1996. I'm proud of that to bring a new machine to Jordan. We were the first in the Middle East, 1996. But I always believe that a fool with a tool is still a fool, not because there is a machine that you have to use it, it has certain indications. Use it properly. The pity that lots of people are using it because they cannot operate. So they treat anything and everything, as if somebody is holding a hammer and he's hitting anything, because he doesn't know what to do with it. This is very irritating paper, written by Douglas Kanziolka. Douglas is a friend of mine, but we differ a lot. We fight and shout at each other, but we respect each other. He respects me and I respect him, but I disagreed with him on this one, and I made my point very clear. He says, is there a place for microneurosurgery? Today, a neurosurgeon must consider the option of both surgery and stereotactic radiosurgery, where no histological confirmation is obtained. So there is this controversy. You say that there is no histological confirmation. So how do you treat things that you don't know what it is? So he said, it is time to consider radiosurgery as a primary management. This, I differ with completely and my voice is now here for all our international audience. I disagree with radio surgery as an upfront treatment for these tumors. His boss, Dade Lansford, about 10 years later, 2014, wrote this paper. Resection is the first line option for cerebral lobotomy in the However, during the last 20 years, stereotactic radio surgery has become an alternative option for CP, I agree for an option for the old people, for the ones that cannot go for surgery. So it is an option, but it is not a primary treatment. And why? Because radiosurgery and radiotherapy, they have many, many complications, including producing the new neoplasms. And I have done my homework and collected the malignancies that occurred after the gamma knife. My series of cerebral and angular angioma 49 cases confirmed, followed up, because there are more. So you may have 100 cases, but the ones that you followed and you have documents are 49 cases. If somebody says, I have 100 cases and I followed them up, he's a liar. So this is the example of these cases with this edema and all these pictures that I showed you. Again, this is my collection. I'm going through them quickly. These are the cases that has been followed for so many years.
various types, premeatal, postmeatal, meatal, you name it. This is one of the cases, premature. And when you go in, this is actual case of my 59 year old male patient. When you go in, this is the facial nerve, and this is ICA, and the tumor is ahead in front, premature. Most difficult. Because you have to go above the nerve and below the nerve, between the facial and the trigeminal, between the trigeminal and the third, and so on. You will work in compartments. So, this is what we did. We work in compartments. At the end of the day, sixth nerve is here, trigeminal nerve is here, facial and vestibular cuticle are here, the three nerves, glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory are here. Beautiful. No radiation, no misery of radiation. This is sixth nerve, as you see here. Another case, again, premeatal, this is facial. And I can, this is the tumor there. So you work between the facial and the, and the trigeminal, and you work between the trigeminal and the third nerve. You can see the particular stoke. You work between the facial and the lower cranial nerves, and so on. Some of the cases that we have done 52 year old female patient with this tumor, and this is the post operative, and this is her before, after, and follow up. Another case, 49-year-old female patient. Notice that many germs are more in females, which is obvious because of the hormonal status. We have prostate problems. Another case of this very, very difficult case of uh, the centered over the intendigenitis and postoperative and the follow-up. Another case from Emirates, this tumor being removed. So my collection is 49 cases, gross total is section 38, and this is corresponding to uh, Simpson grade one. Uh, follow up very, very long, up to 176 months. Mortality, I had one. I lost one patient. Morbidity, there they are. If anybody stands and said I have done 100 cases, I did not have complication, he is a liar. So I had three recurrences. So we'll come to our case, cephalovintine anchor meningioma, presentation of this case. This is a 62-year-old female from Iraq. She complained of, for three weeks from coming to Jordan with headaches, blurring of vision, then had double vision, and she had decreased hearing in her right ear and right side sided facial weakness and spasm, hemi facial spasm. Her face was flickering just like doing all sorts of movements. Right-sided facial hemispasm, which means that the facial nerve is irritated. Hypoglycemic and uh, hypertension, hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic, sorry. She had lab cholecystectomy, vital signs were okay, general examination was okay. Neural examination 15 over 15. You will see that she has a large tumor, but her Glasgow coma scale is 15 over 15, which again stressed the point that the Glasgow coma scale does not represent everything. In Glasgow coma scale is for coma assessment, not for a neurological assessment. She had this arthria. This arthria that her speech was cerebellar, just like that. So this is cerebellar speech, not aphasia. <coughs> she had right-sided hearing impairment. And there was no weakness, five over five. And today, one of the residents uh, called me about a patient and uh, he said he had weakness. I said, what is the grade of weakness? He said, it's simple weakness. I said, what is the grade? He said, two over 10. So that resident does not know how to assess power and he is in charge of patients. I will not mention names, but this should not happen. <clears throat> so she was a taxi and she had free controls at home. This is herself. Five movements are okay. Up, left, right, down, etc. Facial nerve is intact. No weakness. 
uh, CBC, bleeding profile was normal, kidney functions, electrolytes were normal, liver functions were okay, chest x-ray, ECG normal. Let's come to images. Immediately you would see that there is a large tumor here, which is without complex. Pressing the mid, the, the bones and the midbrain severely. Would you believe that some people would give gamma for this? This is a criminal act at its best. Because with the brain stem compression, with the announced result of gamma knife, that they, you will get the result after two years, so you will leave your patient under this compression for two years. And the best you can get is to keep the tumor as it is, or slightly slower, smaller. They don't tell the patient that if the patient, the tumor did not respond to the radiation, he would need surgery. And if he does need surgery, surgery is impossible. It's 100 times more difficult. Money, money, money. Press a button, they are not a surgeon. They call them tell brady surgeons, and they do nothing of surgery. Some of people lost their ethics completely, and they treat these cases with gamma knife. This is with contrast, and you can see the tail. Tail is more in the meningioma, but it is not pathognomonic. You will see tail in TB, in neurocycloidosis, after radiation, after infection, so many. Look, pressing the cerebellum, pressing the pons, almost reaching to the clavus. Look at the edema. We mentioned before that edema is one of the prognostic bad factors bad results, bad surgery, bad tumor when you have this edema because the pair of the brain tissue has been vulgarated and invaded. Look here, we have gone through the tentorial hiatus, which means that major arteries are involved. There is hydrocephalus. So all the bad criteria of this lady is there. Here you would wish that you disappear or the patient would disappear, but nothing did happen. He did not move, I was not selected to go. So, again, look at the enigma. Horrendous. Yeah. There is some restriction, which means that it is very cellular tumor. CT scan showed some calcification. And when you see calcification, it is more of a meningioma. You can see the calcification there. There, there, there. Again, the edema, the calcification. Look at this calcification. Not only calcification, but invasion of the petrous bone. The petrous bone is invaded. Look at this. Very horrendous. And people, I know of people like this, have received the gamma without any accountability. Because we do not have accountability. Look at this. <clears throat> this is the coronal with the contrast. Again, see how much of the brain stem is involved. And the edema, the destruction of the calcification and the destruction of the petrous bone. The contrast uh, sagittal, the calcification, and this is the spectroscopy showing that there is. Uh, a peak there, which may denote that this is a very general query. The MRA, which is essential part of MRI, you should not do MRI, you should do MRI, MRA, MRB. There are three or one unit called magnetic resonance image of the brain, of the arteries, and of the veins. Look at this. This is the posterior cerebral artery and severe cerebral artery being pushed by the tumor. And you would get the report saying, no aneurysms, no ABMs. What a silly statement. As if the angiography is done for aneurysms and ABMs, which are only two 
drops in the ocean of the pathology of the vascular disease of the normal system. Venogram to show the venous uh, sinuses. Uh, we did a few consultations. We consulted Dr. Mahmoud Asad for this lady with the right hearing loss. Mahmoud, are you around? Yes. Can you comment on this? Because I see that she has a problem also on the left. Yes. She has a tumor on the right. So what happens? Well, uh, nobody can see that the the right side, the difference in the right side is caused by the tumor, because we have two, but the right is more than the left. If it comes to me alone, you know, without seeing anybody, I will ask for MRI, without MRI. But this is, uh, if there is any difference between sensing neural hearing loss from one to the other, we always ask to make, make sure that there is no brain tumor. The next thing is the ambitions and reflexes. Can you see it? Uh, which are here. Yeah, as we always say, do that. Yeah. The most important about for us is the stevedia reflexes. And stevedia reflexes can, it's not a diagnostic for red um, meningioma from the schwannoma. But it gives you a clue because the reflexes, the, the sound goes by the eighth and comes back by the seventh. And if it is a schwannoma, it's most likely that the reflexes will be disappear. So, but if this one, the reflexes is normal, this can tell you that it is not a, a schwannoma, it's mainly a meningioma. If uh, Dr. Ibrahim allow me, to say something in the past, because if you know the past, you can appreciate the present and then you can look forward for the future. In the past, before we have CT and MRI, we usually have, you know, the neurosurgeon sent us some people who suspect that there is some tumor. And the only X-ray they have is the tomography, which is the main thing. So we used to do a lot of tests to try to differentiate between cochlear and retrocochlear. We do the stereotype reflexes, sometimes we do AVR, sometimes we do CC test, down is balance test. All that is just to make sure that it is a, a cochlear or retrocochlear. Unfortunately, at that, at that stage, it's a very early detection of schwannoma. But at that stage, it will not show in the X-ray. So no neurosurgeon can dare to go for this difficult place without seeing a tumor. So the result was is just observe. Thank you. <clears throat> so she had bilateral hearing uh, impairment, which most likely is due to atherosclerosis but maybe more because of the pressure of the tumor. We consulted Dr. Kamil Tokan. Kamil is here around. We asked him to come over, but we asked him to see the patient because she is hypertensive and he did uh, echo for the patient and ECB. And he announced that the patient is a low risk for surgery. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Juma is here around. You know, again, we asked him because as I said, uh, for uh, using of steroids in this old lady. Uh, and of course, Dr. Thomas Abaishi has the anesthetist in charge here in this, in this hospital. Um, he says that uh, she will be in VA in days of monitoring. So we had the consent for the lady, which was extensive in Arabic and in English, just in case somebody says that we did not mention it. It says everything what she has before surgery, what is the aim of surgery. And we say the last line, which you cannot see, I read it. The aim of surgery, this is a commitment. I am telling the patient, the aim of surgery is to remove the tumor completely. But this depends on what I will face during surgery. So I am committing myself in competition. My aim is total excision of the tumor. So we'll use this sitting or semi-sitting position. 
We may use all the gadgets we need, the navigation and the neuro monitoring. Uh, this is some of the pictures in our theater. Using the latest microscopes, we have Canevo in, in this hospital, which is the first microscope in the Middle East of its kind. As I said, we use the uh, neuro monitoring for all the cranial nerves. <coughs> And we'll do it in the sitting position. We use this curve, uh, sort of called lazy C uh, kind of uh, incision. I'll remove this uh, part of the bone. Uh, so, to speak more about the semi sitting position, may I call upon Dr. Farasa Baishe, the chief anesthetist in uh, Farah Jamal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Rahim. We can't thank you enough for these uh, presentations. I'll be speaking very briefly about the semi-sitting position in uh, neurosurgery, because this is of utmost importance to our fellow, uh, not only for our fellow uh, anesthetists, but also for the nurses. Is anybody here from the nursing team? Professor uh, Sayyid Ali Faiz, who is the head of the region theater. If the Senate are here, there are no nurses whatsoever, in spite of so many reprimanding these, uh, because we speak about teaching nurses, and if they don't learn, they will not serve our patients well. This is the sixth time in succession that not a single soul of the nursing department come. Either they are superheroes in nursing, or they are extremely ignorant and arrogant. Now, um... Just going back to the lecture, uh, so this position uh, improves surgical access uh, to the posterior fossa. Uh, so we try to make the life of surgeon much easier, even though uh, this position requires very meticulous work, very uh, hefty and uh, be, being uh, detailed, uh, obsessive, uh, obs obsessive, and also we thrive always for perfection. Uh, and this is one of the most difficult positions in anesthesia. Uh, so uh, the, this position has many advantages. As we said, it improves the surgical access. Not only that, it has uh, better surgical teaching. And uh, also it improves the venous drainage uh, from the surgical field, better hemostasis. And the list goes on and on. And what's important for us as an anesthetist, it improves the access for the tracheal tube, the chest wall, the arms. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the anesthetist could observe his patient during the operation. As well as also the importance of the respiratory physiology as there is a free diaphragmatic movement as opposed to the uh, supine position where the, all the uh, abdominal contents press on the diaphragm. And also the shorter surgical time as compared to the other positions, especially the prone position, and it decreases the intracranial pressure. Uh, now, this position also uh, goes, uh, does not go without complications, uh, uh, and this position has many complications that are actually documented and uh, uh, mentioned in the literature. Uh, most importantly is the cardiovascular instability because we put the patient under anesthesia in semi-sitting or uh, completely sitting position. So there's venous pulling. Uh, so the patient would suffer hypotension in the beginning when we put the patient in semi-sitting position. That's why we have uh, several measures. So um, if you notice here that the legs should be almost uh, at the level of the heart. This actually enables the uh, venous return to the heart. And also we use uh, uh, pneumatic devices. It also uh, it helps the, uh, the venous return to, to, to the heart. In addition, uh, when you level the legs at the level of the heart, this is actually very important during surgery because one of the major complications is venous embolism. And putting the legs in this uh, position would actually help to decrease the, the, the gradient between the legs, and uh, the surgical field, and the right side of the heart, and would hopefully would in the hope that would decrease the incidence of venous air embolism. Uh, as you can see, the venous air embolism it's, it's mentioned in so many papers, and the incidence might go up to forty percent. Uh, one of the major complications as well is uh, pneumocephalus. Uh, we might not notice it. Notice it uh, 
intraoperatively, but we actually notice it most in most cases postoperatively. That's why I, I wanted some of the nurses to be here because clinically, the first sign would be agitation and confusion. And this is a very ominous sign for pneumocyphalus. So immediately the surgeon has to be informed because the patient has to go immediately to CT scan. So because if a normal tension would develop, the patient would develop a brain herniation. In addition, there is a major complication that we suffer as an esthetist, microglossia. That's why we have to take care of the positioning. So we would make sure that there is a complete venous drainage from the internal, both internal jugular veins. So we keep two to three fingers between the chin and the internal jugular veins. And God, God forbids that sometimes patients, if they move during surgery, they might, because their head would be uh, held on the pins, they might suffer from quadriplegia. So preoperative evaluation is of utmost importance to anesthetists, and they should evaluate the patient and should know every single detail about their patients. So thorough preoperative evaluation uh, of the neurological condition and the cardiac respiratory uh, status is extremely important. So routine assessment of coexisting medical condition and view of optimization should be performed. Now, uh, a major issue in these cases, especially in this performing posterior fossa surgery in the sitting position, is the question of patent foramen of valve, because the, the, actually the, uh, the, uh, incident, the prevalence of uh, patent foramen of valve in the normal population is around 25%, and it might go up to 40% in those with cryptogenic stroke. So, uh, in addition uh, to uh, that this patient had hypertension, and that's why Dr. Kamel was consulted, and uh, he uh, echocardiogram. We as anesthetists, we uh, almost always request in this center uh, an echocardiogram in the sitting position, so we rule out the uh, presence uh, of patent foramen ovale, so we would avoid the uh, paradoxical air of risk. So intraoperative monitoring, we, um, I just summarized it as routine monitoring for us, but it includes arterial line, which is uh, mandatory in this case, as well as the uh, central uh, venous pressure monitoring, not only for pressure monitoring, but in case God forbid that you have a venous air embolism, an immediate action would be by uh, informing the surgeon who floods the uh, field with the saline. And we aspirate air through the central line, and then we make use of the uh, tilt of the tendon uh, In addition, monitoring of venous air embolism. Now, the most uh, sensitive is transesophageal echo, but this is a semi-invasive procedure which we try to avoid, as well as it's extremely expensive and costly for the patient. Uh, in addition, uh, as Dr. Ibrahim mentioned, we use uh, neurophysiologic monitoring, and the use of these monitors require modification of the anesthetic technique. So these modifications include, not to mention all of these modifications, but some of it is maintaining consistent and modest levels of inhalation or the anesthetic because it affects the uh, monitoring. And avoidance of neuromuscular blocking agents, even though it's very challenging in this position, because as I said, and any movement during surgery would cause the patient a quadriplegia. And in addition, the use of total IV anesthetic during the uh, motor provoked potential monitoring. Postoperative uh, management uh, extubation would depend on the preoperative condition of the patient and the presence of lower cranial nerve dysfunction and potential for aspiration pneumonia may warrant postoperative ventilation. And that's why we stress to every patient before they go to surgery that they might be postoperative ventilation. Uh, and they sign this on the um, uh, concept form. Extensive uh, extra intraoperative dissection, particularly on the floor of the fourth ventricle, also might warrant also uh, 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 postoperative ventilation. ICP monitoring uh, should be considered if postoperative ventilation is required because hydrocephalus remains a risk, and that's uh, Dr. Ibrahim always uses an extraventricular drain, and it's uh, of utmost importance that uh, the nurses in the ICU should make sure that they know what they are dealing with, especially the extraventricular drain, because if uh, the uh, level of the, uh, as Dr. Brahim mentioned in previous lectures, if the level go below the patient uh, head, you might kill the patient. Postoperative hypertension should be carefully managed to avoid bleeding uh, complications postoperatively. Uh, 
a very challenging uh, compl uh, side effect of, of these kind of surgeries uh, and the drugs that we use uh, during anesthesia is post operative nausea and vomiting. And some of the patients really suffer quite badly of this uh, complication, so this should be managed quite aggressively. Uh, that's why we actually use multi drug uh, prophylaxis for post operative nausea and vomiting intraoperatively. And post operative nausea and vomiting should be treated accurately post operatively. And all patients under no surgery on posterior posa should be considered to be a higher risk for post operative nausea because of proximity to the vomiting center uh, of the surgical location. Thank you. Here, here, I want to point out why, why we ask the nurses to be here. We mentioned three points that are very important. They are life saving for patients. That all these patients in the sitting position, even in the supine position, they will have some intracranial air. Obviously, when they are sitting, more of the air will come in. This will cause severe irritation and it may cause herniation. If the nurses don't know this, they will call the ICU doctor and a morphine or betadine will be given, and that will be the end of the story. So here we are, no nurses to know this important knowledge. Nausea and vomiting, how important they are. So anyway, a uh, question? Before we go to the operation, now, this is the reason why we have oncologists insist on getting um, maximal excision of a lesion like this, despite the fact that it clearly looks like meningioma, is the incredible differential diagnosis that we're going to discuss. And this is another reason why we insist upon removing this whenever possible to the maximum li limit possible. Not only would this be the best chance for the patient for excising this, um the and the best shot is the first time around but if you get it wrong the disaster the, the results would be disastrous so if this is a schwannoma uh that's not going to be a big deal because because the patient would have probably been treated properly with radiotherapy had they been subjected to it but if this is lymphoma the patient would have been denied a curative treatment that would have been totally uh, medical. And nobody would have guessed that this would be lymphoma. This would be an extremely atypical presentation for lymphoma. This would be an either primary sinus lymphoma or a secondary sinus lymphoma involvement from another uh, place of the body. Um, Chondrosarcoma would be treated radically differently apart from surgery. These patients won't respond to chemotherapy or anything of, of those natures. Metastases cannot be emphasized enough because these patients are subjected to surgery with nobody having had the proper uh, evaluation. And you would get patients with breast cancer because nobody bothered to do a breast examination that are subjected for uh, a cranial radiotherapy and nobody ever examined them. These are actually true cases. These are actual cases that underwent surgery after having excluded all the other uh, uh, problems uh, as well. Ependymoma is treated after surgery with a platinum, with radiotherapy and then a platinum backbone of chemotherapy. Uh, medulloblastoma is also treated with maximum excision, radiotherapy, and possible uh, a platinum-based uh, radiotherapy after that. Um, uh, Glyometous tumors would be subjected to radiotherapy after the chemo with an alkylator, plus minus. Um, and all of these are actual cases. And all of these, they would have had the evidence buried with one form of modality of radiotherapy or another. And I cannot emphasize how frequent this, not only mistake, this crime happens. It happens on a daily basis, and we face this in our weekly consultation, our daily consultation on, on, on a daily basis, not only on a weekly basis. Thank you. <clears throat> did, did we have patients in Jordan dying because the nurses did not know? how to manage the external ventricular drain? Yes. Many patients died because the nurse thought of this as a drain, and they just put it on the floor to drain more, and the patient died in his bed. So what we say is very important. Uh, now what we will do is to 
put the video on 2D in the main screen and we put it on 3D in the small screen. We'll give you special goggles. It will be ready for you. Please don't play with it as we are doing because when you play with it, the system will fail. What you can do is to do this. You can look at the 2D and then back to 3D so that you can compare the picture in 2D and 3D. Nowadays, in theater, we register and document the surgery in 3D. And in conferences, we present it in 3D. It is a very good way of teaching and very good way of showing exactly what you have done. And what we do here in this hospital is to give the CD or a flash desk to the patient as we are going outside. Remember the patient is sitting, so you will be looking at the back of his head like this. So this is the right side, this is the left side. If you come to the middle, you will see better. Those at the periphery will not see well. So if you come to the middle, you will see the 3D better. مش راح تعرف انا شغال لكن لو مشت الفيلم اذا شفت مضبوط معناها شغال ما شفتش مضبوط معناها مش شغال احكي لنا عشان نشغلها. But please come to the middle. If you come to the middle you will see better. So you don't say. The more you are in the middle, the better you will see. Uh, these glasses will be counted, and if we miss anything, we will make you pay. As I said, if you want to compare the 2D with the 3D, you do this without touching the actual glasses. Yeah, let's go. The nerves you are seeing now, this is the accessory nerve, and the one above it is the vagus nerve. And the one above it is the glossopharyngeal. Glossopharyngeal is a single fiber. Vagus is many, many fibers. Accessory is made of two parts, the spinal and the cranial parts. So we are opening the capsule. And I'm showing this to show that it is very, very tough. We have seen the X-rays and the CT. There's some calcification, but this is very firm, very tough, almost a stony heart. The scissor is not able to cut it. So now, at this stage, I take this piece and send it to Dr. Hassan Fassar for pathology. For me, it's a meningioma, but to have frozen section is mandatory. Now, we are using the ultrasonic aspirator to take the tumor from inside. In Arabic, so that it will collapse and we can go around it because it is tough. Now, separating the tumor from the tentorium, that's the tentorium. The white stuff inside now, that will be the jaw, is the fourth nerve, the trochlear nerve, coming from the back of the brainstorm going this way to go to the coronal sinus. I will show you that this, the tumor is very vascular. I'm showing this clip to show you that this is vascular. Again, to show you the value of 
the sitting position. We did not use a section because the blood will flow down. Again, using the ultrasonic aspirator. Now, I'm attacking the lower pole of the tumor. Here is the vagus nerve, which is very important. I damage it, the patient will have trichostomy. Maybe you will stay in the ventilator until he dies. Unilateral vagus is more dangerous than virus. I'm separating the tumor of the vagus nerve. I'm always taking the arachnoid towards the important section. This is the origin of the tumor. It is here, in this part of the bone. And again, <coughs> leading there is controlled because you want to cut the blood supply of the tumor. So we're attacking here the attachment or the origin of the tumor content and from the subdominator compartments. So this is the origin of the tumor. It's retromeator, subdominator, and premeator. This is the tent. And the white stuff here is the top layer now. And this is the superior cerebellar artery. Now you are separating the tumor of the brain stem. And you will find the arachnoid and take it towards the brainstem because all the lesions, all the important structures are taken towards the important structures of the arachnoid. This is the upper pole of the tumor, the severe cerebral artery. This is the back of the mid brain. Separating the superior vitreoidal vein, the vein of dandy, it's important. There's no way that you sacrifice easily. You can sacrifice if it is really blocking your own, it is not. So the trapeal nerve, the tent, superior cerebral artery, and this is the tumor. Again, I want to take the origin of the tumor. Once I remove the origin, then I can go around the tumor. Using the endosonic aspirator to take the tumor from the side. Now I'm just discovering the vision. That's the vision. But I can't. So by removing the tumor origin here, this is the last attachment of the tumor to the cutaneous bone. This is the facial and the icon. If you damage the icon or you damage the facial, you will get the same as a plus of hearing and facial weakness. So, going down the tumor, once you take it from the side, you remove it piece by piece. There's nothing in neurosurgery in one piece. Those who go out with the tumor as a one piece should not practice neurosurgery at all. It has to be piece by piece because you don't have the luxury of doing anything with anything else. The ultrasonic aspirator is being used at the maximum power, which is 100%. Still, it could not take the tumor out because it's very, very solid. It's very, very firm. Now, there is this vein or artery that is going into the tumor and coming down. You preserve it. It will take half an hour or maybe one hour to separate it from the capsule of the tumor. It's worth it. So it is another word for those speedy Gonzales in your surgeons. There is no speedy Gonzales in your surgeon. You know speedy Gonzales, the right in the comics. Now it runs quickly. Some people think that the neurosurgery is a quick procedure. They should leave the, the profession for another thing, maybe in a garage or mechanic or something. This took so, eleven hours of hard work, meticulous work, from every millimeter level. You can see the facial nerve. You have to preserve it, preserve the arachnoid, preserve the arteries, preserve the veins, otherwise your surgery would be failure. This is again trying to separate that vein from the capsule of the tumor. This surgery shortens your life. That's why neurosurgeons die young. Yeah. 
and then the rest of them. So once you have gone around the tumor, you are assured that you have preserved the nerves, you remove the last ones. Compare the 2D with the 3D to see what we mean by that 3D would teach the residents, it would teach everybody what is going on. So I remove the tumor back. Now what I do is what my residents call the theatrical action. I just put it back to show you that you have removed it. Just theatrics. I will show you that the cerebellum was not compressed. Again, this is a word for the novices, novices who don't use retractors because they don't want nonsense. If you use a retractor properly, it is not actually retracting, just holding things in place. Look at the cerebellum without retraction, it's staying there. So for those novices and the speedy Gonzalez, I say go home. Don't practice in your cerebellum. This is the fourth nerve. Spiritual artery, facial nerve, and cochlear nerve. This is vagus and its uh, three uh, nerves, the plus and three vagus and nerve. And this is the triangular nerve. Now, we have preserved every vein, you preserve the nerve, preserve the cerebral nerve, and I close the dura with this artificial uh, dura so that make it baggy closure. Okay. Histology. <coughs> So marvelous to see uh, surgery in 3D. Looks like you are operating. Yeah, my uh, This uh, case was uh, simple regarding pathology. Uh, you can see. Uh, you can see how this, the cells are mostly hypocellular collagen bundles, uh, some osteo, some somomas bodies, and some slightly cellular areas. But you can see why it, wa it was very difficult uh, to cut for the tumor because it's mostly collagen, fibrous tissue. Next slide. You can see there this some somomas bodies and the many fibrous tissue. And in this area, almost there is it's a cellular in, in indicating so much uh, dense collagen. Next slide. Here again, you can see how much hypocellular and uh, very wavy. And there is, you can see them they are running in almost uh, one row. Uh, and this is why we call this fibrous meningioma. Different from the whirling button that we see in uh, meningothelian meningioma. Just, you can see how they run in fibrous patterns. Uh, this is typical of fibrous meningioma with many collagen bundles. Next slide. Again, here is almost there's it's a cellular here, it's mostly collagen bundles with a few cells. Uh, again, uh, and this time you can see the collagen bundles and the spindle cells running in one direction. Uh, there is no atibia, no mitosis, uh, no hyperchromatia. Next slide. You can see how all, all these collagen bundles with very few nuclei and very few cells. Uh, that's why it is really mostly it's a hypocellular, it's mostly fibrous tissue. It's very difficult to cut in the swoop. This is epithelial membrane antigen. It's positive. Next slide. Uh, progesterone was positive, and this is indicated non tumor. Next slide. B53 was completely negative, and uh, T67, uh, as expected, is next and one person. So, this is it's, my histology is a benign fibroepithelial meningioma. Uh, Thank you. So, this is fibrous meningioma grade one, benign. You excise it completely, end of the story. Patient is well. Why should you use radiation? You use radiation because you are a mediocre surgeon. One plus one equals two. There is no other explanation for it. I remember, I remind you of this paper that we discussed last time, uh, that it was published in the uh, American Academy of Pathology. Uh, done by Dr. and myself. We discussed the tumor size and the atibia, and we looked at the small cell component and the brain invasion and the bone invasion and the closes, the mitochondrial count, metric account, the P53, all the parameters, P63 and progesterone, K67, and we came up with conclusions. So we are active in our publications. I just want to tell you this. We are one of the few centers around the world 
using the semi-setting position. We are experts on this. The other people don't use it because they don't know how to do it. And they use the supine or part pinch position, saying that there is air embolism in the sitting position. I tell them there is air embolism in the supine position. But with the anatomy in front of you, you don't have to imagine. You know your anatomy. See yourself blood that's flowing down. It's easy surgery. You don't need a suction. You don't even need an assistant. First operative course, she had a very good recovery. She woke up on table. If she didn't, we would have sent her to x-ray to see what's the what No patient is put on a ventilator. This is a bad habit and this is bad practice and lots of neurosurgeons in the Arab world, in Jordan, Arab world and the underdeveloped world do it using this. Keep the patient on a ventilator so that he would rest for overnight. He would rest forever. First up, this is without contrast. So this is blood. This is after contrast. Blood is blood, so there's no tumor. This is blood, this is blood. Without contrast, with contrast, blood and blood. No tumor here. No tumor here. And the brain stem is okay. So if Speedy Gonzalez would have done it, you'd have removed part of the tumor and went out and sent the patient for radiotherapy. Because that's what they know, press buttons. We put external drain, we removed it a few days later. Again, if there were nurses here, we'd have discussed and told them what is the value of the external drain. But they are super nurses, they don't need to know more. So this is the patient in the ITU and in her room. The following day, I still, and then she came to my clinic for removal of stitches. This is the discharge summary, detailed discharge summary, many, many pages. <coughs> and this is the follow-up MRI, about uh, six weeks after surgery, again, there's nothing there, no tumor at all. Midbrain is free. Pons midbrain are free. No, no ischemic changes whatsoever. We have not damaged any neural structure, so it can be done. Those who are sent for the therapy are those who are dealt with by mediocre surgeons who do not know how to do the surgery. They are taught just to do bell holes for subdural and to do disc surgery and putting some barai frames and so on. That's what they know. This is what the neurosurgery is for. Plates and screws, like the carpenter. So this is the lady, no cranial nerve deficits, no facial weakness, her hemifacial spasm completely disappeared. And I have to say this, this is a big thank you for all members of our team. I could not have done my job without the help of all these people. My secretaries who really work hard, they will really work harder than I to prepare this material for you. So I thank you very much, Ahmed and Musab. And every member in the team of the hospital, emergency room in the, and the, in the infection control room in the lab, the residents, the nurses, the radiology department, if some of you has not, um, have not been pictures, because when you took the pictures, you were not there, but we acknowledge your help. And of course, our excellent and beauty. Hello, Dr. Abraham. Can we ask some questions? Any Hello. Questions? Any questions, Just to yeah. emphasize uh, to the uh, trainees in the audience, there's nothing benign about the benign brain lesion. When geoma technically is a benign brain lesion, if not dealt with properly in the first go. These patients are doomed to a horrible course of recurrences that would eventually lead to a miserable demise. Uh, not only demise, miserable demise. Uh, if you don't do it properly the first time around, you can't patch it up with, uh, with radiotherapy yeah. and uh, repeat surges later on. Chemotherapy uh, basically does not work in this modality. There are a lot of things that we can do, but bottom line, uh, they don't work. If these patients don't get the first chance 
uh, uh, probably the first time around, they're doomed to a miserable course. And this applies not only to malignant brain tumors, to benign brain tumors. I cannot emphasize this enough. There is nothing benign about a benign brain tumor. Um, I must say this, that to work uh, in a place where you have everything there for you, the latest theater, the latest microscope, the latest instruments, speaks of the administration. So thank you, Dr. Sanad, Dr. Karan, and, and your dad, who is the pioneer of, of medicine in the Middle in East. Can you comment some questions? Recurrence. Recurrence in these cases? Yeah. In my series, I had three recurrences out of 49. Yes, of course. Because we don't achieve what we call Simpson grade one. We call it a gross total, because to achieve gross total, you have to drill the petrous bone. If you drill the petrous bone, you will kill the hearing, you will have CSF leak, etc. So there is this chance of one little cell is there that can come back. Absolutely. The capsule, how do you make sure that the capsule... We have removed the capsule, but the attachment... What do you do? Uh, you may operate again, you may give radiotherapy, or you may observe. What I do if I have recurrence, I wait, I observe. If the recurrence grows bigger, then you have the two options, operation or radiation. But not up front. Never, ever send a patient for uh, radio surgery up front. Never. No more questions, no comments. Thank you very much. Hey, Saeed. Okay. Dr. Abraham, I'm sorry to interrupt. By the way, if you have a metallic machine outside, that will detect this. So you better give it. So, Dr. Abraham, can we ask some questions? Hello. Hello. Uh oh. It looks like they forget us. The Bulmer vibes. Yeah, can we ask some questions here? Uh, left sided weakness. Oh, this is getting worse. Can we ask some questions here? Hey, can you hear me, Dr. Abraham? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, first, I'm Dr. John Bennett from Neurosurgical TV. I'd like to thank you because a lot of people are watching this on the internet, and we had a lot of people on the panel. Uh, one question I have from a Jordan neurosurgeon, Baha Moosin. He asked, what did you do for the three recurrent cases? As I said, with the recurrence in any meningioma, be it posterior fossa or in the supratentorial or in the uh, supracellular, I wait and watch, observe, and look at the symptoms, the signs, and the, the growth, if any, of the tumor. So I don't jump into radiation at all as the first line. I wait. And most of the time, surprisingly, the, the recurrence or the residual tumor would not grow. But if it does, I have the two options again, either to operate or to give radio surgery if it is amenable. Okay, Baha Musin has one more question. He says, what do you mean by gross total resection? As I said, gross yeah, okay. gross total resection cannot be achieved. In the literature, in the posterior fossa, no one at all speaks about Simpson grade one. Because you can never, it is impossibility to achieve Simpson grade one in the posterior fossa. It means that you have to remove the dura and the petrous bone and the foramen magnum, etc., etc. So there is no Simpson grade one. Look at all the literature, which is there. No one speaks about Simpson grade one. We speak about gross total resection, which is equal to Simpson grade two. Okay, Khalif, Khalif, do you have a question of Dr. Abraham? Khalif, are you there? A doctor, a neurosurgeon from Kenya. He mentioned that he wanted to, to uh, comment on something. Well, maybe he stepped away. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Abraham. We are reaching a lot of people, uh, not only in Jordan, but across the world. Thank you very much. That's the idea that we just come across each other and uh, teach each other as, as I, I learn a lot from preparing these lectures and I learn a lot from people asking me good coaching. So thank you very much indeed. Yeah, 27 years. Wow, you've been doing these multidisciplinary for 20. I was surprised to hear that. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it's, yeah, uh, we'll, just, we'll continue and get to more people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.